Hello, Heine. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. And yeah. you? I'm doing actually pretty well as well today. And it's kind of interesting. We actually happen to be in the same room here. Yeah, which is why my mic is muted. But yes. um, you can hear me. Yeah, we, we can still hear you even. So actually, we are here in Oslo in the same room and we are here for Fabric February. So I think that fits the team act theme actually really, really well yeah. with that. Yeah. So, but what we are here for today is actually for the Learn Together series and for the session on ingesting data with Spark and Microsoft Fabric. Yeah. So. Let's introduce the moderator. There is one poor moderator working hardly <laughs> and hard alone today. His name is Olivier. He is a Microsoft MVP and he lives in Belgium. Yes, so. and uh, we, we are really happy to have him behind the scenes because if you send questions, he might be answering them or then getting them to us here on the show as well. Yeah, and he's a really nice guy, so. That too, yes, definitely. Yeah, and so you can follow along to this uh, module that we are going along today. There's some extra bits that we have added, some deeper information than in the module itself. But if you wish to, you can open the link that we have there and follow along with the module itself as well. Or of course, you can go back to it after the fact as well. And of course, this is live and I hope we can be <laughs> interactive. So yes. pop into the chat, say hi, ask questions, be friendly with each other. Yeah, definitely. We definitely hope that we get some nice stuff, real life questions from the chat, like, what does this mean for you and so forth yeah i think that those are always great to figure out what does this mean for us then of course since we are still in the cloud skill challenge if you go to that link and uh, start the challenge and you go through it you will get the 50 percent exam discount code yeah. when you complete it which is great. good and then there is, of course, to go to an exam, you need to prep a little bit. And there is, of course, a session to help you prep for that as well. So make sure you make a note of this and join for this exam cr cram session as well. Yeah, it's just a couple of days, actually. So it's yeah. hmm. convenient. Yeah. And Microsoft have, of course, also uh, added a lot of information for you um at the fabric career hub so go to the link for fabric career hub and start browsing through it there is tons of information in there mm -hmm. and very more and more cool <laughs> things it seems like there's this whole avalanche of cool things in the very beginning of this session before we go to the main content but there will be the Microsoft Fabric Community Conference in Las Vegas in March 26th to 28th, and also some workshops before and after those main days. And now here is also a code for you if you would like to attend this uh, event and you actually get a $100 discount code for that. So that's pretty, pretty nice discount to have for an event like this. Yeah. And then of course, we are now on the second to last session in this uh, Learn Together Microsoft Fabric style. Um, this is wave one. There will be a second wave. Um, I don't have the dates, but it will be announced later on. So if you, this is your first experience with mm. this Learn Together uh, sessions, you have a second chance to go through them. Yeah, so you don't have to worry. And as you see, we have come through already quite a journey through this Learn Together series. So of course, starting with more overview, there has already been some talk about Apache Spark in Microsoft Fabric. So this session will particularly build on that. But if you missed it, don't worry, we have some, some things to help you catch up as well. Uh, we will also kind of return back to working with Delta Lake tables in this module as well. 
uh, in the previous sections, there's also been data factory and data flows brought in. So those won't be something we touch on today so much. Uh, but we will do, for example, some comparison to data warehouses, because that is, of course, like a decision point to make in your design when you use Microsoft Fabric. And we will also get a little reminder of the medallion architecture as well in today's module. So many exciting things ahead. We'll not touch the administrative part. That can be, <laughs> Yeah, you can check that out tomorrow. Exactly. Then there are the learning objectives. So hopefully by the end of this hour, you will be able to know how you can ingest external data into Fabric Lake houses using Spark, uh, configure external source authentication and optimization, and load data into lake houses as files or as Delta mm -hmm. tables. Great. So before we head deeper into those topics, let's just take a moment kind of to orient ourselves, because I think we all already know that Microsoft Fabric isn't just like one thing, or at least it doesn't do just one thing, but it has actually many of these different capabilities within it. And they are divided by these different experiences that we have. So we have the data warehousing experience, the data engineering, data integration, data science, real-time analytics, and business intelligence. And if we look at where we are going to focus on today, we will be mainly under the data engineering category today and working on Spark clusters and then on our data that is in Delta format in our lake house in one lake storage. With notebooks. Yes, with notebooks, mm -hmm. exactly. So there, as we can see from this picture as well, there are many other ways that we can work with our data in one lake storage. We could use T-SQL in the warehousing side and work on our warehouses. And there is some possibility to also how you can work on your data across these experiences, because the point of one lake is to have your data only once. And we can touch on that a little more once we come to the comparison between lake houses and warehouses as well. And then how could you use those across? But as said, today we will really focus on data engineering, Spark, notebooks, and lake houses. Yep. So when your company chooses Microsoft Fabric for an end-to-end -end analytics, the first step is of course, to seamlessly ingest data into your Fabric Lake House. Or you can use warehouses, of course, but that's a different topic. Um, consider the familiar extract, transform, and load process, or ETL, um, moving and transforming data. And then depending on your role and your data needs, you might focus on ingesting first or choose to cleanse and transform before loading. Um, so Fabric Notebooks offers the flexibility to extract, load, and transform external data into your lake house mm -hmm. and adapting to your workflow. And while prior Spark or Notebooks experience is helpful, it's not mandatory, mm -hmm. but it's, self, it's quite easy as you will learn today. Yeah. What is your favorite way to ingest data to Fabric? Oh, is notebooks. it Notebooks? Yes. Yeah. I, I have to admit that it is mine as well. Yeah, this coming from a guy who, who's been <laughs> developing things in SSIS and DTS before that, because I'm I'm old, just face it. Um, but it's, I I've come to love notebooks uh, over the more drag and drop kind of thing because you can do so much more with it. Yeah, the nice thing thing is that you do have like all the flexibility that you can do with PySpark, which is I. I don't, I don't, haven't really come across a situation where I haven't been able to do what I want to do. No, I think you can pretty much do everything you want. No, I, I have one, <laughs> it's a recursive join thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that just killed my cluster. Oh, okay. Mm. Well, but I didn't. Your cluster was too weak. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably, but I, I don't think I can scale up that much more without uh, yeah. my bosses coming hunting for me, so. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So notebooks are really powerful and efficient, and you can learn to love them if you don't love them. You quite will yet. love them. Yes, <laughs> at the end of this session. <laughs> All right. And of course, we are talking about Spark. So we need to first figure out how to connect 
to our data with Spark. But of course, to even think about, well, how do the notebooks work and why do they work and things like that, we do need to understand a little bit about Spark itself. We won't go into like very nitty gritty technical details, what is happening behind the scenes, but it's good to understand some basic things. So really Spark is an engine where you can use a variety of languages for executing data engineering, data science and machine learning uh, tasks, either so that you run those in a single node machines or clusters. And the architecture works so that there's kind of like an orchestrator node and then the actual nodes that do the heavy lifting. And if you're working single node mode, that is then of course, everything is done on one node as, as the name might state. But this is really efficient when you have huge sets of data. It's not, that's not saying that it doesn't work well for smaller sets of data, but you can kind of see the performance benefits when you do have uh, at least thousands of rows. Then you can see that you might not, for example, in your processing, you might not see the difference between handling a hundred rows or hundred thousand rows. The time that it takes to process might be exactly the same. And that is, of course, because it is a parallel processing framework for the data processing and analytics tasks. And then, of course, what is what is like specific about Spark is that it is an open source project. And and we can see this actually across many places because Spark is also then part of many of these platforms that are, are out there. So for example, if we look at Azure Databricks, which is one option, how you can run Spark on Azure, Databricks is built on top of Spark. So it's not exactly Spark. There are then capabilities in there that add on to that and make it uh, even like more nicely packaged and managed for you. But you have also other options how you can run Spark on Azure. So there is Azure HG Insight, which is maybe like the most rawest version of like just regular Spark. I yeah, guess. It, it is the open source. Yes. I mean, everything it's inside HG Insight is open mm. source. It's on Apache, Hadoop, Spark uh, exactly. offering. Yeah. Exactly. But then you can also run it on these Microsoft data platform services that we have. So we had it in Azure Synapse Analytics and we have it in Microsoft Fabric. But then there are differences here. So for example, in Azure HD Insight, you have a little more Azure resource management that you have to do to get everything set up and so forth. In Azure Synapse Analytics, it's maybe a little more pa packaged uh, but then uh, it takes, for example, quite a long time to start a Spark session in Synapse Analytics. And whenever you want to upgrade to the latest runtimes, you need oh, to yeah. delete the clusters and recreate them. Yay! Yes. Hmm. But I would say very much that in Microsoft Fabric, we have like the most easiest version. We have a Spark uh, cluster or pool available right away to us if we want to start using it when we create our workspace. It's there for us from the very get go. We don't have to do anything, but we do have the capability to also define a custom Spark configuration for our workspaces. So that is a setting in the kind of the tenant level that you can set that you can have these custom Spark configuration in configurations in your workspace. And if you have that enabled, then you can have your like specific configuration set predefined so that your users in your workspace can then leverage those. But we have a default one available right away. And the nice thing is it starts really fast. Amazingly fast, yeah. We will see that today as well. And hopefully it lives up to this, <laughs> these <laughs> words today. So shall we first have a look at what Fabric Notebooks offer? Yes. So notebooks, for those who have experience with them, yes, you find them in Synapse, you find them in Databricks. Um, you also find them in Jupyter, which is an open source format to then connect on top of Spark if you want. And notebooks are collaborative tools for coding. So you can code using multiple languages in one notebook. And this is really what sells it to me because mm -hmm. I can have one cell with Python uh, or PySpark, and I can have one cell with SQL 
and then I can have another one in Java if I have ever, ever bothered to learn Java. I haven't. So um, SQL and Python at least. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, because everyone hates doing uh, documentation, you can enrich your comments, at least in your code, by using Markdown language, uh, which means that you can explain your code uh, a lot better than just mm -hmm. by writing inline comments. So, and of course, you can execute one cell or multiple or everything at once if you want. So it's it's quite a handy tool. Uh, and then, it, of course, you can also then uh, set it into production going forward. So deploy it. Mm. And yeah, Fabric notebooks are easy to create, and they can be done in many parts of the service. Um, but they are stored on the workspace level. So um, it might not be the same workspace as the lake house exists in. Mm. If that is what you want, or you can use another lake house, sorry, one lake if mm -hmm. you want. Um, and you can also connect to data, uh, data lake storage as, as mm -hmm. in Azure separate. And mm -hmm. of course, you can also do things like connecting to key vaults that are not part of the fabric service. Yeah. But it, and the default is uh, using PySpark, but then you can just, um, change that as you want and go for um, HTML or Spark SQL or Spark R, actually, uh, and then Ooh. Scala or Java. Mm. Have you, you used HTML in your notebooks? No. <laughs> I, yeah, I was just wondering, because I haven't personally, so. Yeah, I, I haven't used HTML for coding since 2010, something. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> So yeah, uh, but but you can. You That's have options. You have options. Yeah. Yes. So we now that you have the basics of the notebooks, we can take a look at connecting connecting to external data storage. As I mentioned, you don't have to connect to just the one lake. You mm -hmm. can connect to basically anything within Azure, um, or using shortcuts, you can actually connect to S3 buckets as well. Yeah, which is good. Um, so means that it, it doesn't matter where that data resides, you can reach it unless it's behind a private link. <laughs> but that's a different topic. We're not talking about that now. Um, and then you just type in the blob account name, you set up the container name, the relative path um, using a SAS token. Or if you had a key vault connected, you could use a, a specific library for that and then uh, avoid writing tokens or passwords uh, directly into the uh, system. And, and then I think it's an important point that you actually wouldn't want to have your SAS token as plain text in yeah, your notebook. That's not a very good idea. Mm. Yeah, it's not a good practice. And so in real life, you would want to do what Johan was just explaining and preferably had have the actual secret stored somewhere safe. Yes. And then, of course, um, you connect to the sources and read that data into data frame. But depending on your source, you might need a different type of authentication. So yep. service principle, OAuth, or several. So this is an example, as you can see here, where you have the service principle uh, that is connected uh, to a database or mm. Azure SQL database, mm. which is quite handy. So just put in the placeholders and the server names and um, your database name, your client ID, your client secret, and oh God, why can't they do this properly? Because again, you don't <laughs> put that there, you put it into the key vault. Yes. But we uh, will have to have a stern word with the, <laughs> the people who wrote that. Yeah, but mm. it's of course easier, like if you're getting started, yep. it's easier that you don't have too many moving pieces. If you do bring key vault in, it's of course then you then have to figure out how to communicate that as well. Mm. So whenever you like communicate with anything outside of fabric you have to think about do you need to authenticate to it with, in some way so we saw the example with the storage where you used a sas token and then here uh, you then instead have uh, uh, the database authentication uh, using a service principle but then you could have database authentication using the user and the password so like one step always when connecting to external sources, you need to think about how will you authenticate? And sometimes you, I think in data projects, you might need to even talk with 
somebody in another team, for example, to figure that yeah. out. It might not be the knowledge that you have readily available right away. And then the second thing that could come in your way to block you being able to access some kind of uh, data source could be networking, as mentioned. Because a lot of times we do want to secure our databases and data sources in some way, in a networking manner as well. And we don't have yet that many options for how to handle that. No, that is true. But uh, it's, a, it's a very important rule. Um, yeah, while you're testing it out now and playing around a bit, you can always put your passwords and usernames in here, but please um, yeah. look up. There are uh, There's a very nice blog uh, out there that explains how you can connect to an Azure Key Vault from uh, the Fabric Notebooks. Mm. Um, so go and read on that because it's important from a security standpoint that you try to avoid <laughs> or do not enter passwords in here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the big points. And then we can write data somewhere afterwards. Yeah. And since we are talking about the data engineering experience and we're using notebooks, then we also have our data structured in a lake house. Yeah. But what is a lake house? Which is that is actually a good question. Yeah. <laughs> and and lake houses are well, two things. First of all, it is uh, an architectural pattern that mm. Databricks coined back in 2019, which has become really popular. Mm. Um, but it is also the fabric service called Lakehouse, which yes. is just a way to connect and gather the files that are uh, inside. Mm. But um, the Databricks coinage of the data Lakehouse is it needs to have transactional support. It needs to have scheme enforcement and governance. It needs to support business intelligence uh, prospects. Um, storage is decoupled from compute, mm -hmm. which is very important because if you have a SQL database, uh, storage and compute is coupled together. You cannot uh, separate them. It needs to be open, so open source. It needs to support diverse data types, so uh, as in Integer, Numeric, mm -hmm. uh, Varchar, and so forth. And it needs to sort, support diverse workloads. Again, um, business intelligence, self-service analytics, data science, that kind of thing. Mm. And it needs to be end-to-end -end streaming. So you stream data uh, into uh, the lake house, and you can stream it out again as well. Mm. So source and sync. Yeah. And you can see that there's maybe some capabilities here that are very familiar from the relational database world, like transactional support. That is very like, yeah, of course. Yeah. But if we think about back into the day when we started with this idea of data lakes in general, that wasn't there. <laughs> that support no. wasn't there yet. And if you're yeah, dealing with parquet files or anything mm. else, mm. Um, you need to, if you need to update or delete something, you, need, you really actually need to read the whole thing into memory and then recreate the file. And exactly. that can be a very heavy load. And of course, you don't have ACID principles support either in the files, but that's what the Lakehouse file formats mm -hmm. is for. Yeah. And this all enables that we can actually work efficiently in even this relational database type of manner with our data that is actually just stored in files. Yep. And that is kind of the power of Lakehouse. But the different ver versions in uh, in Fabric. So you have Lakehouse and you have the data warehouse. Yeah. And I think since we do talk about Lakehouses, we should talk a little bit about the data warehouses as well, because that is one of the biggest questions that comes up from the very beginning when you start working in the data engineering side, or even trying to figure out, do you work in the data engineering side or do you work in the data warehousing side? And the interesting thing is that, yes, both of them store their data in the one lake layer, and both of them store it in the delta table format. So what is the big deal? Why do you have to choose? Well, the thing comes that if you do create a table in the lake house, you are then able to query it with T-SQL as well. You can 
uh, query it with T-SQL, but you cannot write it yep. once you have created it in the Lakehouse site. And the same goes for data warehouses. If you create a table in the data warehouse side with T-SQL, you are then, there are ways to read it with then Spark and notebooks. But again, you cannot write it. So they are kind of like side-to-side -side structures in a way that you might have. So you do need to make that decision. And so here is some differences in these two uh, experiences that we have and the how we structure our data in our Fabric workspace. So within a lake house, your data is organized into both folders and files. You so you kind of see how is your data kind of underneath yep. your table. But you also have databases and tables. So you can create your lake house and then start to define what kind of what tables do you have under there. Whereas in the data warehouse side, you have only this databases, schemas, and tables structure under there. But you are then able to reference that, that table that you have there in your SQL queries. So that is like the first difference, kind of how, how it is all structured. Then, of course, we have the different languages that we use for querying these. So with on the Lakehouse side, we mainly work with notebooks and in the Spark side. So then we have all the languages that come along with that. So Scala, PySpark, uh, Spark SQL, and R, and so forth, that was already mentioned. But on the data warehousing side, the main language is T-SQL that we would use. So that is, of course, very much dependent on what kind of experience do your users have and, and what is kind of the main way of development in your organization that might or be one factor in which way do you choose? Just remember that the T-SQL in the Fabric Warehouse is not equal to the T-SQL right. in SQL DB. Very good point and important point. So if you wonder if some why something doesn't work as expected, you might need to look into the documentation. Yeah, and of one of the reasons is because um, uh, Delta Lake tables that are uh, under, mm -hmm. the, under the tables in a data warehouse uh, stores the data in parquet files and the parquet yeah. files uh, make restrictions on things like data types. Yes, exactly. And I already kind of pointed to this next row here. So how is it possible to query across items? So you are in the Lakehouse side, you are able to query across Lakehouse and Warehouse tables uh, or even query across Lakehouses. And of course, in your lake house, you can have then the shortcuts to external data sources as well. So that makes it possible for you to even query across your data that might be somewhere even outside of Azure, even in an S3 bucket. Yeah. And then on the data warehouse, it is also possible then to query across lake house and warehouse tables as well. But it's not possible to right across is that the right <laughs> framing but you know across the experiences yeah yeah and then for shortcuts uh you can in the lake house you can have shortcuts for files and tables and then in the way where data warehouse side you can have shortcuts for tables yeah. so now that we've find out what we want to use. Of course, you want to use state lake houses of and we, <laughs> we have connected to them. So now we need to save the data. And yeah, as we mentioned, lake houses are structured um, or support both the structured part of the Delta, lake Delta tables, but you can also use Parquet or JSON or XML mm -hmm. or what have you, if you want. Um, and then you can load the data into a Parquet file or a Delta table to take advantage of the Spark engine because Parquet files is a file format that was made specifically to work with Spark. So it's um, it has a uh, much faster read-write speed than uh, doing CSVs or Excel mm -hmm. files or what have you. So you define, we have the data frame, then we can define the output path um, to whatever file store you have. Uh, then overwrite for the modes. You can also do update or um, uh, other options. And then parquet um, as this file format. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and then prints uh, that it has been written to the output path that you have. Um, if you do the same for from a data frame to a delta table, it is the delta table name that will then uh, establish that in the um, Metastore uh, and then define that you're doing using format delta. And again, mode, as you recognized earlier, overwrite, insert, updates, whatever you have you, and then save as table, which is then the table name that you're getting. Mm. And then you can, in this case, it says print, so you can be told wherever it has been put. And you can learn more about the common file formats in the core data concept module. So you can scan that here now. And we go onwards. So when you write to the Delta tables, they are one of the key features in the Fabric Lake houses. And of course, they're also the key feature in uh, the warehouse. So you can easily ingest and load uh, external data into, data into a Delta table via notebooks. Um, and in this case, we have um, used the format and then save that to load a Delta as a Delta table and table name, do you define it, overwrite mode, format delta, and then save. And it goes out. Mm. So again, we talked a bit about what a delta lake table is, but it is open source. It is open sourced to Linux Foundation. It is actually one of three uh, lake house formats out there. The others mm. are Hoodie and Iceberg, but Microsoft and Databricks are all in on delta lake tables. They then bring that ACID principle to your data lake, and it supports S3, ADLS, uh, Google, and of course also HDFS. And it is a unified batch and streaming source and sync. It has schema enforcement. It has schema evolution. So if you mm -hmm. add a column to the table, it will then update the underlying uh, files so that um, all the non-existing or the new column will then have null values for all the underlying data. It has some transaction logs, which of course then mean, mean, mean that you can do time travel. You can mm. travel back in time and see how and compare a row between different versions of the table. Uh, the transaction log and the time travel uh, is limited to the amount of uh, transaction log data that you store, if that mm. is seven days or 10 days or a month or a year. Um, and then you do updates and deletes, which is, as we mentioned, was quite hard to do on a regular file. And then the, it has an audit history, so you can see what has been changed uh, on the table and by whom. Mm. The data itself is stored in Parquet files. Um, and you can yourself define uh, partitioning keys and so on, so you mm. can partition the data into the different uh, Parquet files. And one one thing is uh, new in Delta tables, and that is not so far at least open source. Uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft did some magic, uh, analyzed how it worked, and they created an V order uh, index on the Parquet files in, or inside the Delta tables, uh, which means that you get uh, better compression and better performance out of your Delta tables, and then you would for a vanilla Delta table. Uh, and as it says here on the code, you can see that you have uh, you enable a V order on uh, Spark Conf uh, setup, and then you can have that optimized write mm. part enabled as well. And both of these are in the Spark configuration set. And you can learn more about the Delta Lake optimization and the V orders by following this link. Great. And before we hop into the next portion we have some questions in the chat so let's just grab at least one or two of them so there was a question about can we query two lake houses or two data warehouses located in different workspaces and well you can because in a lake house you can create a shortcut and so you can create a shortcut to the another lake house in a different workspace and then you can query it across those uh, I know there's been some discussion like, like it's all in one lake, why can't you just, you know, directly query it, but that's, that's currently how it works. And even with two data warehouses, 
you do actually have to create a lake house in which you create shortcuts of those two data warehouses and then query them. So you kind of have to have this linking lake house in between. And, and you can even query it with T-SQL because remember we can query even the lake house side with either work with notebooks or query it with SQL. So even if you have those shortcuts to your data warehouses, you can still query them uh, with the SQL experience because yeah. you also have that SQL endpoint created when you create a lake house. Yeah, and it's important to, to remember this just simply because of the way that Fabric is uh, set up. Workspace is um, the capacity boundary mm. for your data. So even if it's a one lake, it's still yes. bound to the capacity inside that workspace for yeah. now. For now, yeah. And that's really, I think, important to understand that there is that kind of linking, quite tight linking to the capacities. And that's why it is made the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. There is also uh, a second question. Uh, does Fabric support the Unity catalog capabilities for different workspaces and also users' permission or governance to objects? schema table and view and so for whoever asked this question if i go completely to a different direction than you intended you can always clarify with your question but uh i i would understand this as asking like do we have similar capabilities in fabric that we can find in unity catalog for example being able to handle user permissions or governance to objects and so forth and yeah we have a similar kind of uh user access control within fabric but i guess because the unity catalog structure is quite different it's an organization level, level structure that you have for data whereas then in fabric we have these lake houses and data warehouses and so forth so the approach is quite different for user permissions but of course we do have management of user permissions available yeah but on the other hand, maybe what I am interpreted yeah. that uh, <laughs> there is no support for Unity Catalog within Fabric because that is a Databricks specific service. Mm. Um, you exactly. can, of course, use Databricks and Unity Catalog to create your data, data and then share that via shortcut into a lake house in Fabric, but then you will have to let go of the metadata control afterwards. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's important to know. Mm. Great and really excellent questions there yeah so now as we are talking about data ingestion we do need to think a little bit about like why are we ingesting that data and normally when we bring our data in we have all heard about the medellin architecture probably we will have a little recap in just a moment as well so we normally have some kind of raw area that we bring our data into and that is where we start with our data that is where we ingest it and then we can go on from there to transform it yeah so the medallion architecture has three distinct layer or zones and for those who have been working with data warehouses you will probably recognize this because the bronze layer is also known as the raw zone Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you store all your source data in the original format. Um, though there are some people who are doing medallion architecture with the landing zone first, mm -hmm. and then they write data into Delta table, but still one to one with the source um, and call that for bronze. Mm -hmm. It's up for debate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's still the most important part is that it is append only and immutable. Mm -hmm. Then you have the silver zone, and that's the enriched zone. And this layer stores your data source from the bronze layer. Um, so you have cleansed and standardized the data. You structure it as tables. And you might start integrating some of that data. At least you standardize on the uh, timestamps, state format, and so on. Um, and in data warehousing, this is called the EDW layer, Enterprise oh, yeah. Data Warehouse layer. <laughs> Um, whereas the raw zone or the bronze zone tends to be a staging or ODS. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the gold zone. And the gold zone is the curated layer. So that's the fine layer where everything is um, stored, formatted. Uh, you've 
put business rules on it to refine it for specific downstream business and analytic requirements mm. sounds very lot like data march it does I, yeah i don't know <laughs> strange thing isn't it so yeah it's it's just another way of talking about the same thing basically um mm. uh, but it has caught on because i think people understand yeah the way things are moving from one end to the other than if you do it saying ODS, EDW, and DM. Abbreviations yeah. mm. are never a good idea. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> um, very typical nerdy, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, great. And then, of course, once we have our data in our raw area and we move it to our clean area, there's some like typical transformations that we often like to do, or we at least want to do some cleaning of data. and also verify our data quality and consistency in some way. Because if our data is really poor quality, then our silver or our clean layer isn't worth very much, actually. Because then once we build things on top of that, then we cannot rely on them anymore. So quality is also very, very important at this point. So some typical things that we might do in this stage of transforming data from raw to clean is that we might remove some duplicates, for example, deduplicate data. Uh, we might handle error scenarios. So we might validate some, some specific data values, for example, and, and be able to handle any kind of error, error data, erroneous data that we get from our data source. And for example, we might want to convert some null values and get rid of empty entries as well. Anything else that comes to mind? No, that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Those are some really good ones to do, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And that is actually kind of what brings us now to the exercise section. So we will now be walking through the exercise that is also included in the module itself, which will, of course, when you get the chance to get a little more hands on, it becomes more easy to figure out what you actually need to do and what is happening. So we will walk through that today. And, and then we'll have some questions asked for yes. you afterwards. So you need, there is a test. Yes, there is a test. So try to remember everything that we said. Yeah, it's a bit late to warn them, but <laughs> yes. oh well, what uh, the heck. Oh well, hmm. yeah, do your best. But anyways, when you walk through the module, you come to this unit five at one point where you see the exercise. And it says launch exercise, but what that actually does is that you are able to open this um, page that has the in instructions for this specific exercise. And it will walk you through quite nicely, but of course, since we are now walking through it with you, we'll highlight some specific things that are important to know. And of course, everything starts from creating a workspace and remember, for you to be able to use Fabric capabilities, you will need either a trial, uh, trial license or you need to have uh, some capacity in your workspace. So just make sure you always have the chance to sign up for a trial yourself. So that is always one option when you want to do this by yourself. So we're just going to then hop into Fabric at this point. So we are now in the data engineering experience here. And I have my workspace open already. And it is this diamond that tells us that this is enabled for Fabric. So if I hover over it, I can see that it is Fabric content that is available for me there. So what we want to do first when we're starting to work in the data engineering experience the first thing we want to do, of course, is to create a lake house because we need some place to store our data. And when we are in a specific experience, we see the things that are relevant for that, that scope. And I, I have found that this list keeps increasing and getting longer. In the beginning, there used to be like the warehouse. No, this one didn't have the warehouse. It just had like lake house and data pipeline and data flow and maybe something else. It was quite small. But now as things are getting more integrated within Fabric, it starts to grow. So, <laughs> but we will start with a lake house. 
and I am just today going to call my lake house a lake house. Very imaginative. Yes, very, very. <laughs> and so I have my lake house open here. And I get to this nice, nice, uh, like explorative uh, UI where I can see everything that is related and what I might want to create related to my lake house. So of course, a notebook or a data pipeline or a data flow. Those are the typical options that I would want. And we can see that we have both this tables and files section, but there is nothing actually under the, either of them at this point. And at the same time, I actually got this notification that you have successfully created a SQL analytics endpoint. So whenever you create a lake house, it also creates a SQL analytics endpoint that allows you to use the warehouse capacity to query your tables in your lake house. So that is why it's possible to use that SQL experience on the lake house side as well. It also actually adds a semantic model at the same time. That too. So actually, when you create a lake house, you get three things. You get the lake house, you get the semantic model, and you get the SQL analytics endpoint. Kind of like a kinder egg. Yeah, very true. <laughs> Three layers. And it even tells you here with this message here that that happens. But let's get started. We are going to first add a subfolder and let's call it raw data. So we are starting with our raw area of our medallion architecture. And we have that raw data folder there where we will start to bring our data in. And Surprise, surprise, we are going to use a notebook to bring our data in. So we're just going to select new notebook here. And it is going to load that new notebook for us. And here you can see that we have these cells that we were talking about. So where we can then put in our code or our comments for our code or anything like that. And at the bottom here, we can see that, oh, this is actually a Python cell or PySpark more specifically. And if I needed to change that, I can then change the type of cell that this is. So I'm just going to copy paste our code from uh, our exercise. So in this case, we are connecting to a storage location that doesn't need any authentication. So I only need to specify the account name, container name, and relative path. So this is actually one of the open data sets that is available for anybody to use. And just by having the path, I am able to connect to that. And we see that for the connection, we have this uh, uh, specific syntax that we use. So we have the container name first after the, uh, after the beginning part. And then we have the at sign. And then we have actually the storage account name and then the relative path. It's kind of a weird way to destructure the URL that can take a little time to get used to that. That is the way you need to handle that. So now we see how fast is Spark to start up because I'm just going to run that cell. So I just pressed Shift and Enter. And that is an easy way to get your cell running without having to click on the user interface. So I can see session started in five seconds. Not five minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah, that but is really fast. While it's waiting, oh, it's just almost done. But still, we had a question. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Does Fabric offer any tool or utilities to see the maintenance history of a table in the lake house or warehouse? That is a great question. Yeah, I, I haven't seen Purview uh, uh, deliver that yet. However, mm. you can in notebooks, surprisingly yes. enough query the transaction log history yeah, of your data table. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the, there's sort of a utility, a cold, yeah. cold first utility. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's not maybe built into the user interface in an easy way, but you no, can query it. Will probably come later on. I, yeah. would, I think the warehouses has some DMVs mm. available that also that allows you to see that. I'm not sure on the lake house side, outside mm. of the querying on the transaction logs that you can do. Yeah, mm. wonderful. Great question again. So here as the output, we are running this notebook in an interactive mode. So if we have any, any uh, things in our notebook tab that bring output, we will see it nicely. And for example, we had a print command here 
for the path. So we can now see that path printed out here as well for us. So if you have any print, print commands there, then you will see the output in the notebook. And the one thing that wasn't maybe so obvious because it was said that you can also make a markdown cell. So if you do then have a cell and you want to make that into markdown and have some more uh, text here, I could just add here that this, ah, there we go. This is my comment. Nice. Yeah. And I have my comment there. And you can format you can it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or write in HTML if you want. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. I can also do that. So I could add like the very nitty gritty details of what does my processing do in there. So then after we have our data now uh, in our raw data, well, we have actually at this point just read our data into a data frame. Then we of course want to write that somewhere in our lake house because right now we just read it from somewhere. So, oh wow, that copy pasted very bizarrely. So let me get the indentations. So uh, here we have then code where we then want to output this to a specific file location. And here in the code, you can say, see that it says insert ABFS path here. So where we can find that if we want to write this data into our raw data folder, we can go into those three dots ah, and we can find this copy ABFS path. So then that allows me to just get it in here. And we can see that it's like similar structure. We have some kind of GUID, then we have at, then we have one lake.dfs.fabric.microsoft.com and then some kind of GUID, a long GUID over there. Oh no, this is not gonna work, <laughs> sorry. Let's do it this way. This is the smart way, there's the GUID. And then we have the files raw data that we can see here, even in the user interface. So we can see that there's clearly some structure behind the scenes that we cannot quite see here in the fabric experience, but it is handled for us behind the scenes. So we don't need to see that. So these are kind of made invisible to us, but we can see that we can interact with the one leg just the same way we would with an Azure Data Lake storage as well. So you could use a similar syntax if you uh, have an Azure Data Lake storage yet that you want to interact with. So let's put this to run. I should have put that to run right away because that will take a little more time. Uh, it, is, it is a data set that has some data and we are going to load the first thousand rows to a Parquet file because it would take too much time to load more. And as that happens, we should then start to see uh, something appearing in our raw data folder, but it's not quite there yet. So we need to wait patiently for that, yeah. uh, which is always nice when doing a little bit of demos that something takes. But while we're minutes. waiting for it to load, um, I'll just mention that yes, mm. one lake is actually the same thing as as an Azure storage, yes. which means the same API is available. So you can basically connect to it uh, from wherever as yeah. it would be another data storage and vice versa. You can can in Fabric connect to wherever whatever services that are in Azure. Yeah, on the, very good that point. Yeah, that is important. And we can like there's always, if you're just getting started with using notebooks and for example, PySpark, there is of course things you need to learn. Um, for example, right now we are doing this write in overwrite mode. So if there was some data already there, it would just overwrite. wipe it clean and overwrite it as the name says. So we need to learn what are these different options that we can, for example, have with the write right uh, method that we are using here. So while that runs, we can already look at the next bit. So this will write some folders in our raw data folder here. And then after we have our data there, then we want to read that data from that folder. 
then we are going to filter that based on the data load date time. And then we are going to also uh, uh, check this store and forward flag. <laughs> uh, if there are any null values there, we are also going to uh, check for that and filter those out. And I think I said here. So here we are actually adding a column with a current timestamp, and this was the filter one. Somehow looking, looking separately at these rows. And then this one we are going to write into a delta table. So we are specifying a table name and then telling that write this as delta table uh, in append mode. So there's no merging done in this case. It's just adding rows, rows to that table. And then it displays one row. All right, uh, this one is done. It did take hmm, about three minutes. And if we now look at the raw data folder, we should see our yellow taxi folder. Oh, yeah. It appeared there. And if we were to open this, we then are actually able to see the parquet file itself. And, and of course, if we would have like more writes coming in, we would see those also accumulating over time in that folder. So let's. Yeah, there was a timely question here. What? Why is it slow? Is it the, because of the cold cache? I did not actually think about this beforehand. It's only a thousand rows, so it does sound a little long, a bit of a long time for a thousand rows, in my opinion. Yeah. But I'm not sure this would use a cache anyways. No. No, I'm not sure. I have to say. Do you have an answer? <laughs> Shitty call? No, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not sure either. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, this next one should be a little faster. Uh, I I've run this before to know where things take a little more time and where they are a little faster. So um, here we will write the entire thousand rows into the table, but we are just displaying one of those rows here as a result. So it's then kind of also like an easy way to see that it is done writing as well. All right, so we can see there's the one row. And then, oops, I almost went back accidentally. If I refresh my tables, I can see the yellow taxi table here and also the different columns that are available as well. So all right. We have our data there as expected. But also, it is possible for us to actually optimize the delta table writes a little bit. So this wasn't, this was just like regular write in this case. So here, what we are going to do, since we heard about the vorder uh, capability, we are going to use that to make this even faster. So we're going to enable vorder here to be able to leverage that. And then we are going to also enable this automatic delta optimized write capability that will also improve the performance. So it's otherwise it's the same. We have a different table name here. Uh, but otherwise, it's the same thing that we are doing. And now if we compare with just the regular write, it was 23 seconds. And then with the optimized version, it was five seconds. And I find it's actually quite neat to test out different methods of writing and processing your data when you're working with notebooks. You yep. can compare different options quite easily and then see the data for how long it took and really compare like what was the most performant. And then it's just deleting the cell that you don't want afterwards. So it's yeah. very handy. Exactly. And of course, we should now see our optimized table as well. It's identical otherwise in nature. So we don't need to look into more detail from that part. Then, of course, once we have our data in our, uh, we could maybe call these clean tables in our table section, we might want to, for example, then query that data in some way. So uh, let's just do a very easy query there. Uh, we create first a temporary view based on the data frame 
that we read on row three. So based on that, we are creating a temporary view and then we are then querying that table that we have there and displaying 10 rows as we can see. Very nice, very easy. We can even have the SQL query within our Python code as we can see here, use this spark.sql syntax and have our SQL query in there along, along the way. And then let's just do another one as well. And this is the optimized one. So again, we can see a bit of a difference, not as much on the read. So three seconds, two seconds. So not such a huge one. Uh, well, if we look at the more exact time, well, still not a huge difference, but if you would have even more data, we could probably see a bigger difference for the reads as well. Yep, 100,000 rows doesn't really. No. Even though the change from the v or from regular to v order is quite noticeable yeah yeah so it definitely was and we could see with these somehow the first first part was took quite some time i'm not exactly sure why but uh this might actually tell us a little bit so there's a bit of time skew for job 11 so uh most of the tasks have run quite fast, but somehow stage 15 uh, has taken more time. So then we would be able to dig into the logs and figure out what part was that actually based on. Yeah. Yeah. So we could dig deeper. All right. That actually brings us to the end of our exercise. So that gave you a little bit of a sense of how you create your notebook, how do you work with it and so forth. And it's funny when I first saw notebooks back in the day, <laughs> quite many years ago now, I was kind of confused, like, like you have this text and you have this code, like how does it run then? Like if you run it as part of a pipeline, for example, what you might then want to do once you have your final processing in place, you would want to run that Mm. at a schedule or automatically or something like that. But of course, it just then takes the notebook and runs that on some compute, in this case, Spark compute. And it just goes through it as it would go here, kind of how we do interactively. Of course, it doesn't then have this like manually triggering every cell. It runs everything automatically. But it just I somehow had a hard time wrapping my head around that in the beginning which is kind of bizarre, but you know, then you start to get used to it once you work on them with your, by yourself. Yeah, and I mean, if, if you just open the notebook in a notepad, yeah. uh, you will yeah. see that it is quite <laughs> formatted code. So it's yeah. it's easy for the machine to read it and exactly. then just skip through the important parts. Exactly. Um, on that note though, we got a question. If mm. we need to run a similar V order on the warehouse tables, no, that is not no. even possible. No. Yeah. All the optimization is handled by the engine itself for you. So you don't have like a V order command on the warehouse side. Mm. Yeah. The one thing that I forgot to note in the very beginning here in the environment part, we, we can see what Spark uh, settings we are running on. So here this is using the default. Yeah, they can't see your screen now, by the way. So it's... Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Here. Here. Oh, yeah, it's, there they it put is. it back again. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Thank producer you. is nice. <laughs> so we can see what is that Spark runtime that we are running on. So we can see the versions, uh, what size compute is it, medium, one node, and so forth. So uh, we can either then figure out, well, maybe in some cases we need a bigger compute on, or we need some specific versions. So in that case, we might need to set up like a custom, cu custom compute for our workspace. Yep. workspace. Yeah. Which is also important that you can actually then add or attach more computes or exactly. split out from the general fabric and have a special fabric workspace with a separate compute on it, yeah. which is nice. Exactly. But shall we now do the tests? I think it is time to go into the questions and see what has 
gathered on our mind during this session. Yeah. Because it might be quite many new things. So maybe not everything is yet ingrained in our mind, but let's check what is still there. So the first question is here. You can go to that QR code and vote, or you can go to HTTPS slash aka.ms slash polls and pick the question that is correct or that you think is correct. Yeah. So the first question here is regarding uh, that what is the benefit of using Fabric notebooks over manual loads for data ingestion? Yeah, we did talk about this a little bit, but maybe not in so much detail, but let's see if you are able to get this correct. So a option is that notebooks provide an automated approach to ingestion and transformation. B is notebooks can orchestrate the copy data activity and transformations. And C is notebooks offer a user-friendly low code experience for large data sets. Hmm. So Let's we'll see. Give it a little bit of time to wait. Yes. There because... are not many people have voted yet. Come yeah. on. <laughs> I hope you will hop onto the poll uh, URL. It's still there on the slide as well if you missed it on the previous one. So you can still have time to get in here. Oh. All right. So actually, this AKA. URL is currently broken, so there is a link in the chat. So please yeah. go to that, and you will be able to then vote. That is understandable. So yeah, sorry okay. for well, the confusion a little bit. That probably made you divert a little bit. And now we yeah. are seeing votes coming in as well. So great. Good. Yeah. Starting to get people <laughs> into the right place to vote. Wonderful. I see the numbers popping around mm. we're not sharing that screen with you no. no no but we get to see kind of how do the votes start to get distributed wonderful all right so if we maybe start a little bit unraveling and revealing the answer bit by bit i think we can all concur that c might not be quite correct in this case because it's not a low code experience it's it's not that difficult once you get going, but it's not a low code option, no. like for example, the data factory side or the it, it's not drag and drop. No. Yeah, exactly. How about B? Well, well you can't really orchestrate the copy activity <laughs> in there. Even though you can put the notebooks into an orchestration tool, mm, yes. It's not an orchestrating tool. Yeah, very true. Notebooks are often the bits that actually run some kind of action. Yeah. So that means that A is the correct option. Ta -da! Yes, great. Yeah. So definitely notebooks provide an automated approach to ingestion and transformation. Yes, you have to write the code and figure out what kind of transformations you want, but uh, it does enable you to automate that. And it's great to see that majority of you have gotten it correct. That's super. Yeah. Excellent. Then the next question. And again, uh, don't use the AKA <laughs> link. Use the link in the chats. And we'll see. So what is the purpose of the order and optimize right in Delta tables? Is it VOR and optimize right sorts the delta table when queried with PySpark in Fabric Notebook? Is it VOR and optimize right enhance delta tables by sorting data and creating fewer larger parquet files? Mm. Or is it VOR and optimize right create many small CSV files? Hmm. Mm. Mm. Curious or Yes, let's let's see how your answers start coming in, and soon we can then start to kind of go through the different options that we have here. And again, I think we managed to not give the direct answer to people. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but still, it seems like the majority of people are leading towards the right answer. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Great. So if we start again to a little bit start to reveal, I do have to think 
say that C sounds a little wrong. I didn't see any CSV files today. I, I have mentioned specifically that we we're storing in 4K files. Yeah. So it's yes. definitely not that. <laughs> yes. Mm, what about A? Well, the V order and optimize doesn't really, even the name optimize right is maybe pointing that it might not have anything to do with the query part so much. Mm -hmm. That is true. So I would say that no. <laughs> and as it seems, it's even more people who have gotten that one correct than the yeah. previous question, which is good. Yeah. We like that. Yay. Yes. So B is the correct answer here. And specifically, V order and optimize write enhance the delta tables so that it sorts the data and then it is able to create fewer and larger parquet files. Because when we talk about delta tables, what really starts to degrade the performance is when you start to have many, many, many small parquet files. And for those of you who come from the SQL world, you will recognize the same thing with a column store index. Ah, very mm. true. Right. Then on to the next question. And again, same link is in the chats. And why consider basic data cleansing when loading data into a fabric lake house? Hmm. Is it A, to reduce data load size and processing time? Or is it P, B, to ensure data quality and consistency? Or is it C, to enforce data privacy and security measures? And security is important. Yes. But what does data cleansing have to do with that? Yeah, yes. that's a good question. Let's yes. see. Let's see. So we see votes coming in again mm. and at a rapid speed. So maybe the answers are shorter. So it's easier to kind of get to the correct answer right away. And it seems that this is going really, really well. Yeah, it's still majority of you have gotten this one right. Close. Very good. Very good. Yes. So which one is correct? Well, I think we can go with B. Yeah. At least to ensure data quality and consistency. Yes. Data cleansing does have mainly to do with that. Yeah. Eesh. Yeah, I'm like, does it r relate to data load sites? Not so much. Maybe in some cases, but it's not the point of it. The point is to have really good quality and consistency with mm. the data. And again, the majority, the large majority of you have gotten that one correct. Well done. Yes, I think our scores got better and better as the answers went on. Yep. Perfect. Nice one. All right. So should we start with the summary? Yeah, it sounds good. So in the summary, we've gone through the ingestion of external data into the fabric lake houses using Spark, which is the preferred way to go, of course. Um, <laughs> then we've configured the external data source authentication and optimization. And we have loaded the data into lake houses as files or delta tables. And actually, we did both. So that's good. Yeah. Very wonderful. And so if you need to go through the module again, here is the link again and that then you are able to also go through the exercise yourself it probably wasn't possible to try to do it at the same time because it was maybe a little faster and then you have also time to read through all the code line by line and you can try to understand what yep. is happening in a little more detail worth doing that definitely and then don't miss tomorrow's session because tomorrow's oh, yes. session starts at well you can see the link there it starts at 8 a.m. One of this, this way. Serious. Yeah. yeah. And then we have, um, yeah, of course, there will be another wave, but uh, keep the track of the learn, uh, MS Learn to find out where that is. Um, and before we go, let's just remind you that you do get a 50% exam mm -hmm. discount when you complete the Cloud Skills Challenge. Yes. Which is definitely worth going to. Yeah. And, and um, then... you can look at this link to find out how to start using Fabric. Um, 
and it's quite easy. Yeah. Uh, at least if you have um, the admin capabilities on your tenant. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It could be still that in some tenant there has been the fabric capabilities turned off. So then you might need to contact uh, somebody in your organization to get it so that you can enable it for yourself. So that brings us kind of to the end of the main content today. Yeah, and we, we have questions. Yeah, yeah, that is great. So the first question here is that can you replicate lake houses and the content and then switch the data sources using parameters? In other words, a gold configuration with all contents configured for one customer's customer and then replicate. Mm, well, you probably can if you have the mm. same key vault, or at least you can point to the, uh, the same kind of key vaults. You can probably store the lake house uh, filed paths as a secret. Um, mm. I have seen some samples, but I'm not sure if it is applicable here. But you can um, you can define your lake house URL by pointing to uh, instead of using the uh, container name and mm. the storage count, you're using a warehouse URL yeah. instead. Um, I can't remember the format for it, but it is available on the documentation. So you can find it there. I think that would probably uh, help more than using those uh, coded things. Yeah. Uh, degrees. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, we just give a moment moment more if you have any questions yeah i want to ask you johan that what is your favorite part of fabric in its entirety is it what we talked about today or something else i i think it's i think it's the for one uh, well it's the combination of the varied parts of the service really coming together yeah and the fact that it is a SaaS solution yeah it definitely makes like compared to Synapse Analytics, it's so much less things you have to do to get going. Yeah. What about you? Well, I have to say I really like this part that we were talking about today because, for example, the Spark startup time mm. is so much faster than anywhere at this point. Yeah, that the what they've done with the Spark, uh, as, as well as what they've done with the warehouse. I really yeah. love what they've done with the warehouse as well. But the Spark startup times is fantastic. Yeah, exactly. And we do have some more questions yeah. that came in. So how to validate if the V order and optimize has the right job? I mean, can I review the files in the lake house? Uh, has the right job. Um, you can probably at least check on, for example, the number of files and check on the underlying data. That is that is possible. Yeah, and you can probably do a metadata check on the yeah. transaction log as well. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, you always have the transaction log where you can find a lot of information mm. and the metadata regarding that specific delta table. So that would be the place to look uh i'm just trying to why, why i was a little bit like thinking at the same time i was trying to think that what will determine if it has done the job right yeah well, <laughs> that's what i started well thinking you, you about. can do you can do it um uh, the row groups probably yeah, true um Good. verify that yeah and then i think we have a question that a lot of people have been thinking about and it says does this mark the end of azure synapse analytics well, if you ask me, I'd say that uh, then those signups and analytics was marked a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I don't think there has been any official word that has come out about this, but all the effort, well, I don't know if all the effort, but most of the effort from Microsoft about developing is data platform solutions is going to Fabric. That is yeah. the current direction. And if we look at a lot of the capabilities, Fabric is quite a bit more performant in some areas than Synapse Analytics. Well, it's 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 more tightly integrated and better connected. Yes, than exactly. Synapse ever was. Yeah. Um, 
but there are still a lot of customers who are running it yeah and definitely. we will see a grace period at least and yes, maybe yes. they will come up with some sort mm. of a migration path i i know that when they first announced synapse analytics they had some pathways yeah uh, to migrate i think it was snowflake and redshift mm. or something if i'm not completely off yeah very true and i think we will see see like also with fabric there is still some like security capabilities missing so there is also that that some do not yet feel comfortable starting to use it yeah so we will see how it pro there are some bugs there still let's yeah. just be honest and, and say capabilities that. and capabilities yeah so, missing, mm. so it is still a work in progress very much yeah. but the parts that are there are really excellent yeah and again it's a lot better now than synapse was both at the mm. at the time and i dare say quite a lot of it is still not there yeah. for instance the one of my favorite parts is the real-time analytics mm. uh, scenarios and that never got out of beta with our preview with the uh, signups yeah so yeah very true and then one more related to kind of the difference of the pass offering of synapse analytics and SaaS offering of fabrics for a user and i think this is very much meaning kind of the data level user, not really the one who has to configure the Azure resources and mm -hmm. networking in Synapse, but the actual user. Yeah, then lists. Yeah. And I, the, I think the main part you will notice is if you haven't done, uh, if you're developing in notebooks and you come from uh, Synapse where you have mm -hmm. to wait five to eight minutes for the yeah. Spark cluster to start mm -hmm. and it takes five seconds in Fabric. Yeah, that's very true. I think. I think coming from if somebody is coming from Synapse to Fabric, there is a little bit of figuring out how does the whole experiences thing, you know, kind of how do you relate to it? Because in Synapse, it was more that you have everything kind of structured in a different way. You didn't have these different experiences. So mm -hmm. I think that will take maybe a little bit time to get used to like, OK, I have to go through these experiences even though I think the borders of those are kind of fading a little bit. Uh, but that is definitely a difference. And I think it takes a little bit of time to also understand that exactly this difference of lake houses and data warehouses and kind of the that those are slightly separated. Mm. They're kind of boundaries of each other. Yeah. So and I of course, when, and when you're doing the signups dedicated SQL pool, the way to query that versus uh, how it works in uh, fabric might be noticeable. Uh, yeah. I've heard, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard that they've removed this very annoying uh, case sensitive collation as the default. Mm. Uh, so either it's coming or it's already there that you now can avoid that because that is a pain. Yeah, very true. And I think we do have time for like maybe one more question. So there is one question that is there an overall view of all data sources? files, shortcuts, databases, et cetera, that you can see to see a big picture view of all data sources that are coming in, or is it all notebook based? That and, is a good question. I'm not sure. Well, to some extent, I think you can use the one, one lake hub. Yeah. There you can see the different lake houses and data warehouses that you have. But in a way that doesn't really like it will show you what data you have within fabric but it doesn't so much show the sources of course then if you have like a raw area then you can maybe see your sources there and things like that so the one lake hub is definitely the place to like if you need to find some of some specific data that you have in your fabric and you're not sure in which workspace it is that's kind of the navigation to I just came, uh, came up with one more point there. Yeah. And that leads nicely into the other question is ah. how that uh, fabric can be integrated with Purview. Great. Because you have lineage in ah, Purview. Right. And True. yes, you can integrate fabric with Purview. There is a, even a specific Purview hub that uh, mm. is connected. It's not quite uh, as mature yet as we know it will be. Because yeah. um, you still have some of the Power BI uh governance parts with their lineage and their impact assessment mm. which is not integrated into the fabric purview integration yet but i think because it's power bi is so tied to one together with fabric 
-hmm. you will get that into purview going forward as well. And that means that you have that. Great. And with that, I think we just got to the end of questions and we are also at the end of our time. So thank you all for joining. It was really fun today and it was really wonderful to do this with you, Johan, especially since we are in the same room, oh, yeah. literally, <laughs> which is really, really fun. Normally, you know, we are in different places. So thank you much, everyone, for joining. Any last words? No, again, thank you for coming. It was fun to have a, a session just across uh, in the same room as Haini here. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed the session. If you have any questions or anything, mm. just reach out. And exactly. with that, I think we'll just say goodbye. thank you and a goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.